<clears throat> All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin tonight's forum. Uh, I want to thank you all uh, for joining uh, the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference uh, Forum on Voting Rights. My name is Ali Amora, and I'm a board member with the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference, the organization that is hosting tonight's event in collaboration with the League of Women Voters of Chicago, um, who are, we are very happy and honored to be partnering with tonight. I'll be one of your MCs for the event, along with my fellow board member, Barbara Barreno Paschal. Please note that this event is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. Tonight's forum is a chance for all of us to come together as a community, to see one another, to see our neighbors, and it's a chance for us to discuss voting rights, especially with a national election just a few weeks away on November 3rd. It's a chance for us to hear from local experts and community members and to get some of our questions answered. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us tonight, including those of you who are joining us for the very first time. Welcome and welcome back to those of you who, are who have attended our prior community dialogues. Now, before we begin, I wanna take a minute to tell you um, about our uh, host organization, the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference, or HPKCC for short. Uh, HPKCC is an independent community organization founded in 1949, whose mission is to connect people in a diverse, green, and safe community. We convene uh, <clears throat> groups and individuals to network and to, <clears throat> excuse me, and to build community around multi-generational activities, community resources, and major issues that affect our future. Throughout its 70-year history, HPKCC has organized committees and task forces to deal with timely issues. The continuing goal of HBKCC is to meet the needs of an ever-changing community. HBKCC exists to support all of you. Over the past four months, HBKCC has held six community virtual events that attracted over hundreds of attendees on Zoom and received even more views on Facebook Live. You can view these recordings on HBKCC's YouTube channel and on our website, www.hydepark.org. Tonight's community dialogue on voting rights is a continuation of the, of the community building and information sharing that occurred during those initial events. We are excited to host this event with the League of Women Voters of Chicago. We encourage everyone to visit our website, www.hydepark.org, to become a member of our organization and sign up to receive updates. We also encourage everyone to visit the website of the League of Women Voters of Chicago and learn about their organization as well. I'm now gonna quickly run through our schedule for the evening. First, we will hear brief welcome messages from um, our HPKCC board president, Phylan Crawford, um, and then from Catherine from the League of Women Voters of Chicago. Um, second, um, our own uh, HPKCC board member, Barbara Breno paschal will welcome our speakers who will provide us with an overview and information on voting rights. And then at, following that, we will end with a question and answer session. Now, a note on the question and answer session. Um, questions were provided for the speakers in advance. Those that were provided ahead of time will be addressed first. We'll have a moderated discussion uh, for approximately 15 minutes with the uh, question submitted in advance. Then we're gonna open it up to audience members to ask questions directly to our speakers. You can either put your question in the chat and then one of us will ask that of the panel or you can raise your hand in the Zoom app if you would like us to uh, unmute you and allow you to ask your question yourself. Uh, we will call on you in the order that you've raised your hands and participants will be given one to two minutes to ask questions. We can't guarantee that we'll get to everyone's question, but we will do our best time permitting. Um, a few more ground rules as a reminder for our participants. Uh, please remember that this is a public forum out of respect for all the participants Please use appropriate language and keep your questions and comments brief and to the topic at all times. Um, the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference reserves the right to mute or remove participants for inappropriate comments or comments that do not relate to the topic at hand. As a reminder, we are recording uh, and live streaming this event on Facebook. Now I'd like to introduce HPKCC Board President, Phylan Crawford, who wants to share a few words on behalf of the board. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. 
I'm Phylan Crawford, president of High Park Kenwood Community Conference. Welcome to our seventh virtual community forum. 100 years ago, women got the right to vote. 55 years ago, the Voting Rights Act was passed, which reinforced voting rights for black people. Obviously, I am personally grateful for both pieces of legislation because at that time, our society did not want people who look like me to vote. I have voted in every election since I was 18 years old. I appreciate the sacrifice of Congressman John Lewis, who marched in 1965 for voting rights. He was badly beaten by police. We mourned his loss a few months ago. Let us also remember 196,000 of our fellow Americans who have died of COVID-19. Failure of leadership at the federal level could have prevented many of those lost lives. We have an election coming up. Please vote like your life depends on it. Tonight, our topic is voting rights. We have a panel of informative and distinguished speakers. Let me introduce one of them now. We have Catherine, the Executive Vice President of the League of Women Voters, Chicago. Catherine. Are you there, Catherine? I am here. Hi. Hi, can everyone, um, for some reason my, I'm here, I'm here for real. <laughs> okay. I welcome everybody and thank you, Phylin. Uh, I. I second everything you just said. Uh, this is a very important time for all of us to be voting and to get to know what we're voting about. Um, League of Women Voters is 100 years old now. Uh, we came out of the suffrage movement uh, and uh, we formed in, uh, I think it was February uh, 14th was our official uh, date, and we celebrated that this last February, the League of Women Voters of Chicago, we have our uh, centennial, it's coming up in December, so we're going to be coming up with something fun to do that. It won't be at the Cultural Center, it won't be what we plan, but we will still celebrate. Um, we have been, unfortunately, uh, doing the same things that we were doing 100 years ago. We're still making sure that people have a right to vote, that nobody gets in their way uh, on the way to voting, that people are informed. And we mostly do that with voter registration and candidates forums. We're also a nonpartisan politi uh, political organization. We are not apolitical. Once we agree on something, we are out there uh, pushing our um, our sense. For example, uh, we have come out uh, for the fair tax in Illinois, and we will advocate for that. However, we never uh, will uh, support uh, or endorse a candidate or a political party. So we're nonpartisan in that sense. Anyway, um, uh, 2017, uh, a bunch of us got together and we started a unit of the League of Women Voters of Chicago in uh, the South Side, and we meet uh, now virtually uh, the third Monday of every month at 5.30 for social time, 6 o'clock. Anyone's interested in being part of our South Side unit, uh, please get a hold of me. My co-leader in that is Melanie Klaus, and I did, uh, right when we got started, put a link to the League site in the chat. So, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Barbara. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Not yet. So this is going to go back to Ali Amora. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you all. So, um, so yes, so, um, and at this point, we are going to begin our panel, um, and uh, we are transitioning over to uh, HPKCC board member Barbara Barena Paschal, who will begin us uh, by introducing our speakers. Thank you all, and uh, welcome to tonight's event. 
Our first speaker is Ms. Ami Gandhi, who is a senior counsel with the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Ami will speak along with all of the speakers for about eight to 10 minutes on different topics, including election protection, mail-in voting, in-person voting, how to be an election judge, how to sign up for all of these things. So we'll start with Ami Gandhi, and then she'll be followed by Alex Boutros with Chicago Votes, Mahima Parani with Ballot Ready, and Catherine Mardyx with the League of Women Voters. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Ami Gandhi, and you, you have the floor. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join. And I'm among many friends and fellow advocates and colleagues in this conversation. So really looking forward to the Q&A as well. As you heard from Barbara, I am Ami Gandhi and I work at Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. I'm an attorney there and I lead our voting rights work. And my organization consists of advocates and attorneys, we're nonpartisan, we're focused on advancing racial equity and economic opportunity, and our organization has been around since 1969. My work is focused on lowering barriers to the ballot for historically marginalized citizens and addressing the racial gaps in our voting system. Just as an example, even in Illinois, even in the year 2020, we still have a racial disparity in voter registration rates when we compare white citizens to, on the other hand, the voter registration rates of black citizens, Latino citizens, and Asian citizens. This is one of the reasons why voting rights advocates have tried to enforce voter protections like our state's automatic voter registration statute, for example, and we currently have a federal lawsuit that's pending in the courts, trying to do anything we can to close that racial gap so that people have fair and equitable access to voting in Illinois. We see other kinds of problems as well, not just the registration aspect of our system. Voters living in census block groups that are entirely black, for example, on average must wait longer at the polls and have longer wait times at the polls as compared to communities that have no black residents. It's completely unacceptable in this day and age that we still have those differences. You know, before I go further, I wanted to share with you that in the years that I've been advocating for expanded voter access, I've never been more concerned than I am now about voting rights being undermined. And we're facing the unprecedented pandemic, of course, and also a federal administration and other forces who are acting to restrict voter access even more. These crises are definitely landing with greater impact on black and brown community members. And if we want to protect the fundamental right to vote, we must listen to those communities that are most directly affected by these problems and intentionally address those racial gaps right now. Let's go back a bit about why we have those kinds of racial gaps in our voting system. From the very beginning, our elections were set up for only a privileged group of people to perpetuate the power for those that were holding it. And um, in particular for white landowning men. And despite the incredible victories that advocates like you all have won over the years, Unfortunately, the remnants of our racist system still persist, even showing up during our most recent primary election. In every election, Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights takes a large number of calls to our nonpartisan election protection hotline at 866-OUR-VOTE. And we hear from voters all across Illinois and Indiana who need help casting their ballots. Every year we get questions about registration, how, when, and where people can register. We also get questions about polling places and people are wondering where can they exercise their right to vote. We see problems with requesting and receiving vote by mail ballots, electioneering, or in other words, candidates or campaigns who unfairly pressure voters, equipment malfunctions, even polling place closures or other things that can change unexpectedly. 
we even see issues like voter intimidation, unfortunately, even though those situations are not as frequent. And these kinds of challenges, you know, especially the kind of tech hiccups and um, registration questions and snafus, they might seem like minor bureaucratic issues. For example, if a community member is incorrectly asked for an ID in order to vote. In Illinois, we don't need, we don't typically need to show an ID in order to vote if we're already registered. For some people and particularly low-income community members and people of color, that unnecessary or illegal question could mean the difference between whether they stick with it and complete the voting process or whether they decide to stay home or not participate. In this year's challenging primary election in March, we saw how COVID-19 unfortunately took a further toll on voter access. We received many calls to our hotline from callers whose, vote, whose polling places had changed because of the pandemic, often with no notice at all. We heard from many voters because of their health situation, they were homebound or hospitalized uh, for COVID-19 or they were staying at home to prevent from getting sick and they were in many instances disenfranchised because they could not jump through the many hoops required to get emergency access to a ballot. Every election, we work with community members in pretrial detention at Cook County Jail, and I know several of my colleagues here tonight are in this fight as well because there are chronic issues there with accessing voting rights there, even though we're talking about community members in pre-trial detention have not been convicted are simply in that restricted environment because of financial inability to pay bail and then are severely restricted in terms of their ability to exercise their voting rights. So we have poll watchers there and conduct advocacy in that environment as well. And there's more confusion now than ever about how much access, whether we're talking about community members in jail or others, um, how much access people will have this time around. We also do voting rights work in Indiana, I wanted to mention. Um, there we have had issues with also last minute changes, long lines, particularly in areas that have higher populations of people of color, intimidation, confusing, and sometimes just nonsensical and overly restrictive rules about absentee ballots. We actually filed two federal lawsuits recently challenging different Indiana laws that impose unreasonable burdens on voters and could well disenfranchise people in November, particularly Black and Latino citizens. Our organization believes that if we want to protect the fundamental right to vote, we need to listen to those communities most directly affected by disenfranchisement. That's one reason why we really try to prioritize working with incarcerated and returning community members as much as possible. But you, you know, there's more work to do. There's no question that because of barriers due to COVID and other circumstances, our ability to hear those voices is harder than it's ever been. Um, you know, I say that frankly, and kind of from a place of frustration that there is a lot more work to do to lift up those voices in our collective advocacy. But incarcerated community members, you know, one of the major achievements that they accomplished in recent times in Illinois is to um, write and pass the civics in prison law that was enacted last year that requires in-person peer-led civics education to incarcerated Illinois citizens who are preparing to return from incarceration. And I, you may hear more about that this evening as well from others who have been involved in that very directly also. And it's very likely that community members will continue to be disenfranchised because of misinformation or other barriers for this upcoming election, unfortunately. You know, there has been emergency legislation enacted this year in Illinois that certainly helps matters in this crisis time by expanding vote by mail and addressing other aspects of our voting system, but the work is definitely not done. There are many ways that you can help protect access to the vote. You're gonna be hearing about those this evening. And I know that many of you are looking to get involved or will help get others involved in being poll workers, for example, and helping to preserve that option for in-person voting for 
community members who may prefer to or may need to exercise their right to vote that way. I know many of you have been helping to spread the word about the availability of vote by mail up for this election, because for many people that is the safest and healthiest option. You can also help our organization protect voting rights in this election by spreading the word about our hotline, 866-OUR-VOTE. And we have companion lines for community members who speak other languages, languages other than English. If you see something concerning, if you have a question, big or small, whether it's a flyer with misinformation about voting, something you see on social media you want more information about, or someone getting turned away improperly from the voting process. We really would appreciate if you give us a call at 866-OUR-VOTE to report the incident and let us know how we can help you. Our, vote, our right to vote is precious and if we don't work to protect it, we can lose it because of all of the threats that exist these days. Don't let the misinformation and confusion surrounding this election keep you from exercising your fundamental right to vote. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ami, and, and thank you also for pointing out how important it is to listen to communities most affected by disenfranchisement and lifting their voices directly. That was a really powerful statement, and thank you for sharing information about 866 Our Vote. The next speaker we have is Alex Boutros with Chicago Votes. Alex, the floor is yours. Hello, is it my turn? Should I go ahead? All righty. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Alex Boutros. I am a community organizing manager with Chicago Votes. Um, Chicago Votes is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that works to empower young folks throughout Chicago to be involved in the civic process, whether that's voting, whether that is holding elected officials accountable, um, passing legislation, writing legislation, implementing legislation. Um, so thank you so much for having me here today to talk about voting rights. Um, and so Chicago Votes, as we work specifically to uh, support young folks to vote, um, we understand that it's not that easy just to tell young people, go out and vote, you have to vote, this is your civic duty. We need to first take a step back and we need to look at what obstacles are in the way for young folks to vote. What can we be doing to support young folks to not only get out and vote, but to make educated and informed decisions. Um, and so Chicago Votes, like Catherine spoke to nonpartisan, we are nonpartisan in the sense that we do work on policy and issues that young people care about, uh, but we will not endorse a party or a political candidate. Um, and so we are really here just to ensure that young folks know that um, we're here as a resource and there's many ways to vote and there's resources to vote. And so how we do our work and how we look at the obstacles and dismantle those obstacles for young people is through our three programs. We have our um, Parade to the Polls program. So the idea to make voting fun and engaging and celebrating our collective power um, as young folks and we throw parades where we get together with high schools and colleges. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to do this during COVID, but this is what we did during the March primary and before. And we usually partner, we'll do citywide ones as well. Um, and then we have our, we have our give a shit program. So that program is specifically focused on elevating, uplifting, and 
pushing forward issues that young people care about. And so we do that in many ways. We have our give a shit happy hours, uh, which is usually at bars, you know, meet young people where they're at, um, where we center an event around a specific issue, whether that's policing and how we fund the police versus how we fund our schools, um, or that's gentrification throughout the city of Chicago. And so you can look out for our give a shit happy hours this election, they will be virtual, um, but we're still doing them. And then we also have a give a shit collective. So if you are a young artist and you care about different issues in this city, um, it doesn't necessarily just have to be voting. It could be all of the issues around um, Chicago that we deal with on a daily basis. And we use our art and creativity to bring these issues to life. Um, and really start to dismantle them together. And every Thursday, so even tonight, um, we're going to be talking specifically about a big obstacle that young people face to vote, which is being incarcerated or being arrested. And so Ami just spoke a lot about the work that we have done together to dismantle this huge barrier uh, that young folks face, whether they are in pretrial detention um, and they literally can't pay bond or they were given a no bail um, but they should and they do have the right to vote and so together we passed a law making cook county jail a polling location and so to enforce those voting rights we plan on we're working with the department of corrections we're working with the board of elections and other advocates um, to show up and be an election judge there be poll workers um, so we can make sure that voting rights are being upheld and that this law is being upheld that we worked so hard to pass. Um, and so that brings me to the last program of Chicago Votes, which is our Unlock Civics program. Our Unlock Civics program works in the intersection of the American legal system um, and voting rights. And so like I've been saying, folks that are in pretrial detention throughout the state of Illinois have the right to vote. The only time you lose your right to vote is when you are serving a conviction um, inside of a correctional institution um, or if you are on furlough and the second that you are released from that correctional institution, even if you are still on probation, if you are not serving that conviction inside that correctional insti institution or on furlough, you have the right to vote. Um, and so that is a huge myth that we are continually dismantling um, through a whole bunch of social media, public education, and directly calling folks that are in neighborhoods that have high rates of criminalization. Um, and this week actually for Chicago Votes is our Unlock Civics Week. So I would really implore all of you, all of you that are watching, tuning in, to go to Chicago Votes Facebook page at Chicago Votes. Twitter, at Chicago Votes, I think it'll come up as at Chicago Votes Action Fund, and our Instagram. And we have tons and tons of information um, that we are sharing all the way from terms and language that we use when we're talking about folks that have been in and out of the American legal system, that term specifically calling it the American legal system and not the criminal justice system, because there's no justice and we're not boiling someone down just to a criminal. Um, they are a voter, they are a human, a person that has the right to vote. Um, and so please share that information that is super vital. And so something that we've had to make sure to do to reach out to young folks uh, and engage them in this election is to be creative and make videos um, that make sure that folks know that not only can they vote by mail, not only can they vote but in person, but there are also ballot drop boxes now. And so We've been calling every single Tuesday and every single Thursday. You can join Chicago Votes and our Leadership Development Democracy Corps Fellows as we call through young and we text through young voters um, to make a plan to vote with them. And so I'm going to put the link to the, our phone banking right here. Um, and then I'm also going to put a link to our link tree that literally has all of our um, resources to share. So if you go through the link tree, that's where you can sign up to volunteer with us. Um, and then I'm also going to share in the chat box 
a link to a Google Drive that we are continually updating with graphics and voter education resources. Um, so please feel free to utilize that and share that Google Drive folder. Um, and the last thing that I will say is that we tomorrow are going to have a public training. And so if you click that link tree link, we're gonna have a public training on voting in prison. Because as we did, me and Ami did just say that folks lose their right to vote while they're serving the conviction, we don't believe that that's right. We do not believe that folks should ever lose the right to vote, especially, especially if you are still being counted to draw district lines. Um, it reminds us of the three-fifths compromise, which is not okay. Um, if you are still paying taxes, because folks that are incarcerated pay 25% surcharge tax on all their commissary, um, which goes back to the state, no taxation without representation is what we believe in. Um, and so we are fighting for voting in prison, and you can join us at a training that is public tomorrow from 3 to 4.30 p.m., um, and in the link tree, there is a Zoom registration link as well. Um, oh, and I will send it to all of you right now. Let's see if I can do it. So the second one, the link that I just sent is the Google Drive. And then I will send this link tree, which will bring you to um, something that has our website, it has the link to our voting in prison, uh, the sign up link for our phone banking, and um, go to our social media and that's how we will share all this information. And thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Alex, for your presentation and for sharing all the really wonderful information that's available to people to help unlock civics and share information about how people can get involved, including the training tomorrow. So thank you very much. And now we have Mahima Parani with Ballot Ready. She's an electoral fellow and she will be sharing information about Ballot Ready's platform. And Ballot Ready is a, a social enterprise that we, we don't endorse any particular company. We're just really interested to hear the information she provides that is free and available for everyone to use. So without further ado, Miss um, Parani, uh, welcome. And Hi everybody, it's so great to be here. Thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, as Barbara just said, Ballot Ready was founded a few years ago. We're a social enterprise out of Chicago and we are very much founded out of a need to solve um, a lot of the problems that have been listed kind of already on this call. Um, we are out here, we're a nonpartisan organization trying to help folks both make plans to vote either by mail or in person, um, and then also research all the way down the ballot so that they can vote informed. Um, we produce uh, a number of tools and they're all available for free on our site at ballotready.org. So I will demo that for you today. Um, am I able to share my screen? Uh, if that's something that, okay, I don't currently have the ability to share my screen, but if the host could enable that, I'll go ahead and share my screen and do that. Um, but the tools on there include a tile to check your registration and then also be taken to your Secretary of State or election official site to register or double check your registration if you haven't already. Um, we also have a voter guide that's got um, bios, issue stances, and endorsements for every single candidate, run, candidate running all the way down ballot um, in every state and municipality around the country. Um, and we're also covering ballot measures in any municipality where the population is greater than 50,000. So definitely covering the city of Chicago. Um, and then the big shift that we're doing this year is really focusing on turnout, both by mail and in person. All right, looks like I can share my screen now. Um, so this is our site. It's available at ballotready.org. Um, you start by entering your address here and then hitting get started. You'll see here a number of the tiles that I just mentioned. Um, the one I really wanna focus on today is our voter guide available when you press research ballot. Um, you'll see here on the, on the left, a list of all the positions that you can vote for. Um, this will cover every single thing that you'll see on your ballot. So every single judicial candidate and every single ballot measure. Um, when you click on a position, 
uh, first you'll see up top everybody that's running for that position. And then when you actually click on a candidate, um, you'll open up their full profile. So links to all of their socials, um, all of their elected and also paid job experience, and then education. Um, down here, we've got issue stances. Uh, these are all sourced directly from the campaign websites, and that's the only source we'll use for issue stances. Um, as an organization, we're committed to staying nonpartisan, so we'll pull all the same information for every candidate all the way down ballot. Um, once you've researched both or all the options for president that you want to look at, you could then click add to my ballot. And then you can do the same all the way down ballot, kind of looking at the different options, making your choices, and then adding things to your ballot as you're ready. Um, then if you click up here to the print icon, you're able to print out your full ballot and then actually take it with you when you go and vote or when you fill out your mail-in ballot, if that's what you're planning on doing this year. Um, if you sign in, you're also able to share your ballot with your friends. Um, then going back to our main election center, the other tile I wanna highlight is request a ballot. Um, this year, like I said, we've really shifted to help, help folks vote both, both by mail and in person. So the first thing you'll see when you click this screen is all the information you need to know to request a ballot in Illinois, including all of the deadlines, um, policies around, you know, once you've requested a ballot, you're still able to cast a provisional ballot in person. Um, and then once you click vote by mail, first we'll help you check your registration. Um, this actually isn't the address that I'm registered at, so I can show you how it'll help me register if I choose to do that. Um, it'll pick up on the fact that I'm not registered and then take me out to the correct election officials website so I can do so. Um, and then moving forward, it'll sign me up for reminders and then that way Ballot Ready is able to follow up with folks at every touch point of the vote by mail process. So making sure people are actually turning in their ballot request applications, um, making sure folks are returning their ballots by the postmark by deadline, or if they miss the postmark by deadline, also making sure that they're able to get to a ballot box and vote in person. Um, and then the last thing we'll do, is take folks to the correct form that they need to actually request their absentee ballot. Um, you can also email yourself a blank PDF of the form and then we will follow up in emails with all of the instructions you need to make sure it gets to the correct place at the correct time. Um, so that's how you use ballotready.org. Um, totally free tool and would love if people could promote that within their organization, to so their friends, to so their families. Um, it's extremely helpful and works nationwide. Um, this is a little bit more information on the ballot ready research process. Um, years of effort go into building these voter guides. So ballot ready has already completed gathering all the positions that are going to be appear on every ballot in 2021. Um, so we completed 2020 quite a ways ago. Um, now we're in the stage where we're gathering candidate lists from local election officials around the country. Um, and then once we have complete lists, we'll be able to launch um, candidate research. So all of that down ballot bios, issue stances and endorsement information that you see on the site. Um, some fast facts about how this research looks. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people running uh, on the ballot on November 3rd, besides just people running for president. Um, so far, we've researched 45,000 candidates completely, and they're all available on our site. And we've helped over 600,000 folks request their absentee ballots. Um, we also partner with several different companies, um, advocacy organizations, political campaigns, um, and a ton of nonpartisan organizations in order to get the word out about voting informed and voting by mail. Um, you'll see some of the big names here. I included some of the Illinois folks that we work with, so League of Women Voters, um, some national orgs, like that's Snapchat in the bottom left corner, March for Our Lives, Vote Save America. Um, and this is really exciting for us because we started out 2015 making paper voter guides for one election. Um, and then this year we have a goal of reaching 50 million voters uh, and helping everybody vote informed and vote safely. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks here who are involved in civic work and advocacy work um, with their day jobs and not. So here are some ways that you can get involved if you have folks who would be interested. Um, if you go to about.ballotready.org slash get involved, there's more information on all of these options. But uh, we've launched a curriculum for folks in schools. We've launched uh, a series of ballot parties that you can host with your friends so that everybody you know can vote informed. Um, and we've also launched the Super Voter, which is a social media campaign that you can participate in. Uh, we also created a merch store at shop.ballotready.org. So check that out if you're so inclined. Um, and I'm around to answer questions after this in the Q&A. Looking forward to getting to know some people here. And then uh, I've also included Valerie's email address and my LinkedIn on the slide deck, which I can circulate after the session if anybody has more questions. Um, thanks so much.
Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Parani, for your presentation. And 50 million, that's, that's an ambitious number. I hope you get there. And hopefully a lot of people in Illinois and in Chicago, and this audience at least, will, will use um, the information they need with tools like Ballot Ready to be informed in this election. Thank you. Our final speaker before we get to question and answer is Katherine Mardykes with the League of Women Voters of Chicago. And you met her a little while ago, and now it's her turn to present on uh, some very important information about mail-in voting and other topics you need to know for this election. Thank you, and Catherine, take it away. Sure, um, and I will need uh, to be able to uh, share my screen if you haven't enabled that. Um, we love uh, Ballot Ready at the League of Women Voters, and um, in fact, we work with them to create the Illinois Voter Guide, which is um, a version of Ballot Ready that's, that we take all that information and then we add to it with the WTTW uh, video guide. We put all those links in whenever we have candidates forms, we advertise them in that guide. And so you get all of ballot ready. I put that link in the, um, in the chat if you wanted to have a look at it. Uh, ballot ready is amazing. And you know what it's especially good for? It's especially good uh, for voting uh, for the judges, uh, for confirming and voting because as you move down the ballot and get to the judges, you one, you get to see only the judges that are gonna be on your ballot because researching can be difficult when you don't know which ones are gonna be showing up on your ballot. And two, um, they consolidate all of the bar association recommendations. So you can go there, see right away and then click. So it's, it's just fast, it's just really great. Okay, let's see if I can get this screen. Uh, Okay. Um, all right, well, let's give that a try. So um, I guess I'm gonna just do some nuts and bolts. Uh, so many things have been changing that we just thought we'd do a quick run through. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on registration, uh, though uh, you definitely uh, wanna make sure that you're registered and that you are registered at a, the correct address. These are the deadlines. Um, uh, online, uh, you can register to vote online, but do know that you're going to need uh, either the dr a driver's license or an Illinois state ID, uh, along with the last four digits of your social security number. The reason is, is if you're doing it online, they need a way of grabbing your signature and they can get it off of that ID. Uh, that's good until October 18th. So if you're gonna do that, do that before then. The mail-in form is easy. You can go to the website, same website, print it out, fill it out and send it in. All you need uh, for that is the last four digits of your social security number. Um, and then in person, you can go either to an early voting site or you can even do this on election day. Uh, you can run into a deputy voter registrar and do this. Uh, you will need two forms of identification, one that has your address, and, uh, and that, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. That, that's the quickie version. Oh, and just one thing that uh, the board is saying, if you have moved, uh, uh, before October 5th, go ahead and uh, update your registration. After October 5th, they recommend that you vote at your old polling place, okay? Now, voting. Well, we've got three ways to vote in Illinois. Uh, vote by mail, which I'll be spending the most time talking about. Early voting, uh, which at the super site uh, starts September 24th and then uh, voting on election day, that is at your polling place. Um, and I will keep moving here. Uh, okay, vote by mail. Uh, applications can be requested online. Um, it is actually, if you haven't received one already from the Board of Elections, uh, that is the best way to go. Uh, if you voted in the uh, 2018 November election, the municipal elections 2019, and you voted in the March primary, then, and you registered uh, to vote since March 2020, you should have received in the mail a, uh, 
an application to uh, request a mail-in ballot. Um, you probably didn't receive one if you jumped ahead and went ahead and requested one online. I requested one online, so my, uh, my uh, voter information didn't have a, uh, anything in it. Um, what you, uh, you do uh, for two reasons at this point, uh, if you haven't done it, want to go online to uh, request your ballot. Uh, one, because it is safer, uh, or in terms of uh, accuracy, if you go in and you find yourself in the voter rolls, number one, it's a great check just to make sure you're registered, because if you can't find yourself, then you got to back out and go and fill out the registration uh, form. Uh, but what you can, what you do is you find it, you request the ballot, make sure you put an email in there so that you can get proper uh, notification from the board. Um, and so then nobody has to try and read your handwriting. Nobody has to rekey in what, you, uh, what you've written. Uh, it's just all the information is more accurate and you save time. But um, mailing it in is just as good. Uh, whatever you do, make sure you do it. Um, so here are some links uh, for requesting. I'll put some of these links in the chat as soon as I'm, I'm done, if that will work for you all. Okay, um, so uh, a couple of things. You will be able to find out if they received your application uh, for vote by mail. Uh, I went in under, um, under uh, the link to vote by mail for a request. Uh, it, there's a link that says check your status and I went in I put my information in and it said that they received and processed my request in uh, I think it was end of June so right away if you're concerned you haven't really you're not really sure whether they received your um, your request you can go in and check there periodically um, the ballots uh, will start going out in order of, re of receipt of application uh, September 24th. So expect uh, your ballot in the mail uh, after September 24th. Uh, you'll want to put it in the uh, envelope that it arrives in. It has postage on it. You will need to you know, fill it out, seal it, sign the envelope, and that's really important. Uh, according to the Board of Elections, most of the problems that they have are people sending in ballots, uh, envelopes that have not been signed by the voter. So make sure that you sign your ballot. Okay, now that's another thing that you need to work, you might want to worry about. A lot of you may be voting by mail for the first time, and you may be someone who has actually uh, registered to vote when you were 18 and you may not be anywhere near 18 anymore. I know that my signature looks completely different. Um, so if you're concerned about that, uh, you will be able to mail in or email an updated signature. It's basically this form says signature down the side, um, at, but otherwise it looks just like a mail-in voter um, voter registration form. And you can put your, your signature there and send that in, or you can snap a picture of it with your phone and email it to the address below. Um, uh, okay, uh, uh, this is not in the order I was hoping to put it in, but uh, so you returning your ballot. Uh, you can put it in a secure Dropbox uh, there will be people at the Dropbox who will timestamp your, uh, your ballot, your envelope, uh, and these Dropboxes will be at all early voting sites. Um, they have hoped to have a few more, and they might. There's a rumor that there might be something over at Montgomery Place, at least for a day or two, uh, but we'll have to wait and see if that actually materializes. But your early voting site in your ward or in any ward, wherever you might be, uh, will have this drop box. Uh, they also uh, will make sure uh, that you signed it. That'll be something that they do. And every evening the ballots will be removed from the drop box 
and there will be uh, following chain of custody procedures. Um, there had been discussion about these being inside or outside, but there isn't uh, good information on that yet. Um, so we're not sure that people will be able to drive up or not. Um, now, let's say that you are homebound or you, you know, as many of us are these days, um, you can have somebody drop your ballot off for you, but you do need to fill out the back of your ballot uh, with the information uh, that someone is doing this for you. So you just flip it over and fill that out and that's fine. Um, a person who uh, is collecting these and taking them for many will be limited to only bringing 10 ballots at a time to the Dropbox. So, um, you know that. Um, or you can put them in uh, a mailbox. Uh, let's just say if you're going to be mailing it, you really need to do, as soon as you get that ballot, fill it out and get it into the mail, as we all know that uh, the mail has, uh, <clears throat> well, let's just say it hasn't been as reliable as it has been in the past. Now, um, the deadline for uh, these envelopes uh, to be, it must be postmarked or time-stamped by November 3rd. And this is just an aside for you. Uh, if uh, do not think that on election day, if you have not done anything with your mail-in ballot, that you can go to your uh, polling site in your precinct and hand it to a judge. By law, the judges cannot take your um, mail-in ballot. So if you find that you've uh, lost, uh, let time get away from you, you will need to go to an early voting site which has a drop box, which are now supposed to be open on election day. So do not give it to the judge and please do not throw it into the neighborhood um, drop, uh, mailbox because it will not be properly time stamped because there are only certain pickup times. Uh, you can take it to the post office and, and uh, mail it from a post office to get the proper, proper time stamp. But just know that um, you need to get it to a drop box or get it in the mail early. And even if you're getting it into the mail late, make sure that you um, get it time stamped. Not time stamped, but you know, postmarked. Ah, here's a slide that's been added uh, since there's been so much noise. Uh, only one application can be processed for a voter. Uh, you can only vote once, obviously. Um, if you provide an email address, uh, they'll let you know when they received your application uh, and they will send you an online tracking number when your ballot is sent. So it's very much similar to when you are, the way you track a package. Uh, this information will also, if you have not given them an email address, will be posted on the Chicago Board of Elections website under the voter information. It's the same place where you would check your voter registration status and it will list, uh, there's nothing there now because nothing's gone out, but it will list uh, where your ballot is and, and what, um, what the process is. Um, this, uh, this is going to be a problem for some who have had, who may have uh, <coughs> requested their ballot, but in the meantime, uh, have had to move uh, either to another location, maybe out of the state with relatives, uh, so many reasons right now. I'm so worried about all the people in the West and these fires and what they're doing if they've already requested their ballot. But what you need to do, this is rather a little bit more labor intensive, but what you need to do is immediately contact the vote by mail department of the Board of Elections, uh, the Chicago Board of Elections. And here's the number, 312-269-7967. Uh, okay. And let them know where you're going to be. All right, there have been a lot of questions about uh, people who have been voted uh, this way before. What if I change my mind? What if I don't want to? What if I haven't gotten the ballot? I, there are so many questions around this topic. All right, if you simply change your mind, uh, 
That's fine, provided that you have not already sent your ballot in. The minute you fill it out and drop it in a box or put it in the mail, it's over. You have voted, there's no changing. Now let's say um, that you still have the ballot, you haven't filled it out. You will be able to vote in person, either at an early voting site or on election day, provided that you show up with the ballot in hand so it can be vo voided before you um, are allowed to vote, okay? Okay, what happens if the voter can't produce the ballot um, or you go to vote and they say, no, you, you were sent a ballot, you can't vote at this point. Then, unfortunately, at this point, you need to vote provisionally. Um, that uh, eventually it will be counted if it's deemed appropriate. Um, we try to avoid uh, provisional voting as much as possible. But um, in this case, you would go ahead and vote. And uh, if your ballot was never received, obviously they know uh, that you are not voting twice, okay? Voter will be notified when the completed ballot is received, just like when a package has been delivered, the voter will be uh, contacted if there are problems on the ballot. Now let's hope that you've taken care of the signature problem in advance with that signature form, but that would be a good time to do it if they got a hold of you and said your signature doesn't match. Now, how are they going to be doing that? They will have uh, judges, election judges, who will be looking at these ballots, these envelopes, not the ballots themselves, but the envelopes. Um, three judges will compare the signature on the uh, ballot envelope to the voter's registration signature. All three must agree to reject the ballot before it is rejected. Um, once they've, all, once they've uh, agreed that a ballot is good, uh, the ballot is scanned um, and this information is then stored um, and, and these results are ready uh, for them to be released to the voters precinct as soon as the polls are closed. Uh, different uh, states do this differently. Um, I know that, uh, you kind of have a sense of that. Uh, for example, um, Florida, I believe, is one that uh, has all this uh, early voting inf or, uh, vote by mail and early voting information early. Um, and you see a big jump and then you wait forever for results. Those are states that are allowed to do this. Some, they have to start that day. So um, it's just get ready, as everyone has said, be prepared not for election day or election night, be prepared for election week or maybe election two weeks. Um, it's just the way things are gonna be this time around. Hey, Catherine. Yes. Uh, we're gonna need to wrap this up a little bit so we can start the moderated question and answer. Uh, okay. So if you have um, just another minute or so, please, thank you. Absolutely, yeah. This is the detail that I wanted to get to. The rest is just more everything people already know. Um, okay, and uh, early voting uh, in our area, it's in a couple places, and uh, here's information on Board of Elections, everything you can do, and that's everything I was planning to do. So, uh, we can go to the questions now. Thank you so much. And uh, this is a lot of information, as you all can tell. And we will be sharing this presentation and materials in a follow up. So be on the lookout for that. Now I'd like to reintroduce Ali Amora, who will be moderating our question and answer session. And as you may recall from the beginning, we'll have a couple of questions that were submitted in advance. Then we will open the floor to the entire audience to ask any question you have on your mind about this topic. We also will have a short announcement from Julia Klein about some uh, very helpful voter registration drive information in the coming week. So Ali, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, <clears throat> and thank you to all of our panelists and speakers for um, sharing us this really wonderful information. Um, and so we're gonna start off with um, a few questions that were submitted in advance. Um, and as a reminder to all of our participants, uh, we'll do that for about 
10 minutes or so. And then we're gonna open it up, open the floor up to everybody who is here. Um, you can submit your question as some people have already done. We'll get to those um, first, hopefully uh, in the chat. But if you want to ask a question yourself, um, you can raise your hand and you can start doing that now. Um, and then once we call on you, we will give you um, uh, the Zoom permission to go ahead and ask your question, okay? So um, please bear with us. We'll try to get to everybody's questions. Um, and if we don't, we are sorry in advance. So we had some questions. Um, I think um, first question we had, which Catherine, you might've already answered. If you request a mail-in ballot, are you required to use it? Um, and I think we've already answered that. If, if not, you can feel free to, or anyone else can jump in. Yeah, I think the main thing is if you request it and it arrives, if you don't intend to use it, you've got to hold on to it um, and bring it with you to your early voting uh, site or the, your uh, day, election day polling site. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, okay. if, if someone ends oh, yes. up in a situation where, you know, the, something unexpected happens and it's a gray area and mm -hmm. you know you didn't vote on it, but you left it at home and you want to vote in person, anything like that that you have questions about, please feel free to call us at 866-OUR-VOTE so we can walk you through the backup plans. It's good to, it, it is easiest if you bring it with you, if you find yes. yourself needing to figure out something different and you know, when we, we talk to one voter after another, people are not trying to double vote. People are not trying to commit fraud. They're trying to figure out what they're allowed to do to exercise their right to vote. So let us know if we can yeah. help you. In fact, I would say uh, before you uh, vote provisionally for any reason uh, to, give, uh, to give them a call. I would, I would just trigger the call right away. Even if you think you know what you're doing, it's just not a bad idea, right? Thank you, and I put it in the chat. It's in, uh, uh, Ami, it's 866-OUR-VOTE, correct? Okay, great, thanks. Um, okay, thank you both. Um, okay, we had another question here about, um, uh, are you all reaching out to um, CPS high schools um, and like to be a part of educating parents um, and seniors or signing up for their like meetings? Um, so is anyone doing any work with um, Chicago Public Schools in general? Yeah, um, Chicago Votes, one of our most favorite and exciting partnerships is with Chicago Public Schools. We usually partner every election to throw super fun parades to the polls. And so right now we are working with the civics administration uh, at CPS and with civics teachers uh, in high schools in CPS to brainstorm different ways to remotely engage uh, you know, high schoolers that might be voting for the first time or can, you know, work with their communities to get their communities to vote um, and sharing important resources like that. Um, so yes, 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 yes. Thank you. And, and, and can they reach out to you um, and your organization if they want to be involved in that? Yeah, definitely. Especially if you're a teacher in CPS, please, please reach out to me. My email is alex at chicagovotes.com. I can put it in the chat right now for you. Um, awesome. And if you're interested in that, please reach out. Yeah. Okay, and I see it. Thank you, Alex. Anyone else want to chime in? The, the league is very involved in, in high school voter registration. Uh, we keep a, a chart of all the different we, we, work with, uh, we work with our uh, collaborators too, so that we know uh, which, who's been to which high school. It's been a little hard for us right now. I know that um, Annie Williams has got something going and she's still going, uh, she's still uh, going into some different uh, areas, but it's just been hard because they're not there. So we've created a, uh, a flyer this uh, goes is, is email and has you're able to share it on social media so that you can actually pass it to, to your friends so that's we're kind of the pyramid game is the best we can do right now I'm afraid uh, they're hard to get to. thank you Catherine 
Um, yes, Mahima? I can also chime in for ballot ready. Um, this isn't as big of a push this year, but in previous elections where we've had school board elections, ballot ready is super active in making sure our database is functional for all of those. Um, and then one cool thing we're doing this cycle, not directly at CPS, although if anybody here is connected and would like to get in touch about this, um, we're working with an organization out in Minnesota to actually put on a mock election for seniors um, out there to be able to use our voter guide and cast their ballots as such. Oh, nice. That's very cool. That's very cool. I um, have used Ballot Ready for a very long time. Um, I love Ballot Ready, and I highly suggest everyone to use it, and I tell all my friends and family about it as well. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, cool. So we have a, uh, we have a few minutes. We're going to still get to some of these um, questions that were submitted in advance, um, and then we're going to start to get into the questions in the chat, and we see we have one hand raised so far. Um, okay, so... And I'm not sure if this was uh, discussed, so forgive me, but for, for people registering for the first time in Illinois, um, is a photo ID required? If we can just uh, mention or talk about that. And I, the, yeah. the question says that um, c the CBOE, which um, I think is the Chicago Board of Elections site, and the motor voter form give contradictory answers. You know, I think where the confusion arises is that uh, to uh, register to vote online, you need a uh, driver's license or a state ID. They are not using the photo uh, of that. It's not a photo ID that they need. They need the signature off of it. And so I think that's where some of the confusion comes in, but uh, no, no photo ID is required at all to register or to vote. Gotcha, thank you. Uh, okay, and so um, let's see. So there's another question here. Um, what can I do to energize my city and state elected officials? Um, and uh, particularly in regards to, uh, you know, voting rights and voting in general. Um, and I know that, you know, uh, you guys have given lots of um, ways that we can do that. But if maybe you want to chime in, if folks tonight want to get involved or they want to energize their local communities, perhaps you can give us some ways that they can do that, whether it's through your own organizations or if you have other suggestions for them as well. <laughs> Don't all jump at once. It has to be like modified for the environment that we're in. <laughs> everything, I was, I, everything I was about to say is not happening right now. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, so those who want to get involved, um, I, I think that we have several organizations here represented. Um, we have lots of information in the chat. So if you are interested in getting involved with any of these organizations that our panelists represent here, um, or with HPKCC uh, ourselves, you can find our information um, for almost all of our organizations in the chat. Um, and we'll put up some more information before the night's over. Um, we'll take one or two more questions that were submitted. Um, and then we'll move on to live questions. There's another question here about will there be enough poll workers for early, early voting and for election day itself, or should local community groups try to recruit people for that? Yeah. Recruit, recruit, recruit. Yeah. Especially Alex. for a young person. We need young people. How young? Uh, doesn't Chicago Votes have a, a recruiting? Isn't Rudy working on recruiting? Yeah. Yes, we, um, in the new law that was passed for this election, it allows election judges to be as young as 16 years old. And you do not, there's no, um, like, GPA requirement. There used to be a GPA requirement, which is pretty problematic in and of itself. But for this election, that's not a thing. So if you're 16, 17 years old, um, for you, there is also not the requirement to have to be registered to vote in Cook County. However, if you do want to serve as an election judge in Chicago and Cook County, you do need to be registered to vote uh, usually. And so please, please sign up um, if you're interested. The link tree that I put in there, you can go to Chai Poll Worker, is it .org, um, to sign up or you can go to our link tree, which I'll put again down here. Um, and we have the link. It's like an interest form and we'll make sure to get you 
$230 on election day. Um, that includes a little training and the day. You can also work early, uh, early voting, um, if that's something that's interested, interesting to you as well. But yes, we need election judges and community groups should work together to recruit folks. And, and Ami, we need poll watchers too, right? Our, is, our, Absolutely. Is, yeah, I, I know that our organization for one will be standing ready with legal poll watchers. It's going to look different this year. It has to, you know, out of respect to voters and election judges, we, uh, we definitely want to respect people's space, but we will certainly have many pro bono attorneys and staff who will be ready to help in person if the need arises. You know, we're available on the phone always, but mm -hmm. some things do require the in-person attention. Yeah, the League of Women Voters, if you're a member, uh, we can get you credentials to be a poll watcher. Um, I've done it, it's, it's, it's really, I like it, actually. <laughs> we, we took care of some problems, it was, it was really good. I see this question here too in the chat from mm -hmm. Betty. Which, 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 uh, this is the, is this the first one about the early voting sites? About Secretary of State's office? Um, you can oh. feel free to, to, I can't, let me try to look for it. If you find, find Betty, it, you can go ahead Betty and ask is, it. Uh, Betty is such an expert. She uh, can just unmute herself and tell us. Yes. What <laughs> sure, yes. And actually, why don't we go ahead? Um, Betty is, has raised her hand. So if we can, um, to our tech support team, uh, allow Betty to jump in and unmute her so that she can ask a question or comment. Let's see if I can find it. I think she's joining us now as a panelist, maybe. There we are. All right, Betty, can you Betty. can you hear us? You if you can unmute yourself. And we know you got that camera. You waited two months for it. You you might as well. Okay, um, uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay, so. Um, Today I got a call from a senior because I work for Rainbow Push and she called and said she got a letter from the Secretary of State telling her that she had not received an application for a ballot and she had never mailed it in. Of course, she had talked to me earlier. The minute she got it, she called and asked, what should she do? We said, fill out the application, mail it in. She did it. The letter says they never re the board never received it. I called the board went online along with Jim Allen. We found her name and her address and it was received August the 28th. I called her back, but in the meantime, when she called, they told her she wouldn't get an application for a ballot until October. I told her, don't worry about it. Her ballot was received August 28th. I mailed mine in and got an email because I have an email address. Today, when I got my mail out of the mailbox, I had a letter from the Secretary of State telling me that my application had not been received. I know it was because I received an email telling me it was received. Now, if the Secretary of State doesn't have enough money to get automatic voter registration done, why do they have money to send all these letters out to all these people who have already applied and already know that they their ballot their application was received. What is going on with the Secretary? Yes. That's my question to Ami. Wow. That's and a great question. I, I would like to uh, just think about that. That's a great question. Yeah. I have the same question, but I think it's worth us asking. You know, I know a lot of us are part of a nonpartisan coalition, Just Democracy, and whether it's through that or just in our individual capacity, mm -hmm. I think it's worth us trying to get to the bottom of that, because that is going to confuse a lot of people, certainly, who have been trying to follow all the steps and be proactive and get this done early. Um, Secretary of State's office under the emergency legislation enacted this year is sending those mailers, as you know, Betty, but I'm also responding to this question in the chat, that they are um, empowered by that 
new state law to send those notices out. But yeah, it was supposed to be an efficient thing. This is, you know, funding that needs to be used for some really important needs right now. So it's confusing to seniors. It's very confusing to seniors when they know they filled in their out their application and sent it in. No, it's confusing to everybody. One thing I did want to bring up um, is that. Um, thank you. No, thank you, Betty. A lot of people are receiving uh, applications for a mail-in ballot uh, that they didn't ask for separate from what is ma being mailed out. And this is happening, especially in other states. Um, well-meaning organizations are, are, are sending individuals uh, these uh, applications for a mail-in ballot. Um, and uh, a lot, they look, people are thinking, oh, there's something nefarious going on. This is really bad. Uh, but uh, they are able to do that. It's just that what you need to do if, and you might be talking to people out of the state more than in the state, is to tell them, look at it, make sure it's an official uh, uh, mail-in application, and look on the envelope to make sure that the envelope, which is stamped, uh, is to the uh, Board of Elections. Um, but this is happening a lot. I, I hope this, this is just, this is, they're just messing up. This isn't just somebody trying to throw, throw this election into confusion, I hope. Anyway. Thanks, Betty. Thank you, Betty. Um, okay, we had a couple other questions, and Catherine, I don't know if, they, if it was answered, if you saw them um, when you were uh, presenting, um, but there were a couple questions about, um, uh, well, actually, this was, um, I think this was from Betty, um, but it wasn't about the Secretary of State. It was about the early voting sites um, opening on October 4th, but the loop super site opens in early October. Will there be a drop box? It, it actually is opening September 24th, the, the, uh, the super site, and there will be drop at the super site. Gotcha. Yeah. What is it? Um, remind me, uh, 191 North Clark. Okay, one night, so 191 North yeah. Clark. I'll put it in the that. super site. Can I? I think. Did we lose? Did we lose Betty? Yes, we lost her. I'm just. Can we bring Betty back? I don't know. We're working on it. Um, ah, there she is. Okay. You're muted, Betty. Okay, what I was saying is the ballots are not being mailed until September 24th. So the super site will be open for people to go in and vote, but yes. they won't have a ballot for a drop box at that point. No, no, I, yeah, I don't know when they're actually gonna have the drop box there, but certainly people will need their ballots to be able to drop them off. You're absolutely right, Betty. Yeah, there's gonna be a gap there. So yeah, most likely early, early October is when That'll get started, yeah. Um, and then I think, Betty, I think you also had a question in the chat about if someone is bringing in your ballot to drop off for you at an early voting site, mm -hmm. you were told by the Chicago Board of Elections that that person also needs to sign the envelope. Uh, that wasn't Betsy. me, but Betsy. you do have to sign it. That wasn't that's my Betsy. question. But you do have to sign saying that someone uh, gave you permission to bring their ballot in. It does have to be signed by the person bringing it in. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Everything that's on there needs to be filled out. Uh, the person needs to give permission and who it is needs to be filled in. There's a spot right below your signature for, for the person to sign. Excellent. Um, yes, and that was yes, and that was from Betsy. Sorry, I couldn't see. Um, it just had a it just had a B E, and I couldn't see the rest <laughs> of the name. <laughs> um, and so yes, thank you, Betsy. Okay, um, so let's see if we have um, some more questions. I have a question um, for Alex. Actually, um, I'm I'm really fascinated and interested in the work that you guys are doing. Um, 
to uh, you know register people to vote um, and to get people voting who are in Cook County um, Department of Corrections. Um, I, I work as actually a public defender. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the, the rights of my clients um, are, you know, and how they're affected by um, either being incarcerated or um, by, um, you know, convictions are always uh, part of my everyday conversations. But maybe if you could talk a little bit more, um, I'm curious also to know if, you know, that work also extends, um, you know, beyond the jails, uh, maybe to like the families of those folks who are, are, are in jail, or if it extends, if there's an extension into the community as well from that work. Um, I don't know if there is, but if you could speak to some more about that, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, and so usually our Cook County Jail Votes Program, we go into Cook County Jail every month to register voters. Since we can't do that because of COVID, uh, the way that we are making sure that folks have access to voter registration was through working with Chicago Lawyers Committee, uh, Rainbow Push, um, Women League of Women Voters, to ensure that uh, the law that we pass, voting in jails, is being upheld. So there's an early voting site um, in the jail so folks have access to same-day registration. Um, the first time that this law was implemented was in the March primary election and same day registration was used uh, in an incredible amount as it is usually on the outside too because that is a tool that folks um, use a lot and it incredibly expands access to voting and voting rights. Um, and so our work does extend to folks families as well when we're registering folks to vote in cook county jail we often ask them as well if they want to provide a phone number so we can um, make sure that their families are aware of voting rights for folks that might have felonies on the outside um, and so we are continually sharing information about voting rights for folks that have had felonies on their record um, i have worked with uh, Chicago Lawyers Committee and specifically Ami on here to literally go canvassing <laughs> in neighborhoods that have high rates of criminalization and talk to folks on the street and anyone that we can possibly talk to to make sure that they're aware of the election protection hotline 866-OUR-VOTE. Uh, we put up a whole bunch of yard signs that the Chicago Lawyers Committee has all over the place um, and usually we go door to door and folks are like, what? I, this person has a felony. I didn't know they had the right to vote. Um, and so dismantling that myth is always really important. And that's also why we, um, that is also why we passed the Reentering Citizen Civic Education Act to ensure that we are dismantling this myth before folks even leave the prison. Um, and so this is something that we're working with IDOC. Um, they're supposed to be peer educated classes um, because of COVID folks are getting a curriculum that we created. And so ensuring that folks are at least getting that curriculum that can be shared with family members when they're released as well. Awesome, thank you. That's, that's really great information, it's good work. So um, thank you for sharing with us. Um, all right, so, um, there is another question um, from Don Posey, who asked if, um, can I early vote at any polling site? And Catherine shaking her head yes. So the answer is yes. You're, you're muted, Catherine. Can you, can you unmute? Yeah, every ward has an early voting site. And then there's the super site downtown. And uh, you can vote if you're downtown uh, working, you can vote, you can go anywhere. Um, you don't have to go to the one in your ward. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, okay, so at this time, um, we're, we're kind of almost um, at the end of our questions. Um, so what I'm gonna do is uh, we have someone with us here who I'd like to invite to give us a brief announcement. We wanna welcome Julia Klein um, who's going to give us a brief announcement about volunteering for voter registration drives on National Voter Registration Day, which is Tuesday, September 22nd. Um, so Julia is with us. 
if Julia, you can unmute yourself. The floor is yours. Hi, Julia. Hi, how are you? Welcome. Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Just making yes. sure my um, microphone is okay. Yes, Hello, we everybody. can hear you. I know many of you. Nice to see you all. Oh, good to um, see you. Yes, very briefly, uh, I, uh, together with some Hyde Park residents, have, oh, I've got two pairs of glasses on my head. Um, I've uh, formed an organization we are calling Neighbors Who Vote, and we have put together a dozen different voter registration events for the Hyde Park Woodlawn area in the coming days. And uh, we are looking for more volunteers, um, for sure. That's the main ask. But then we're also doing, uh, because many of our, these re registration drives are happening at residential lobbies. And so they're not open to the public, they're just for the residents of that building. But we need people to um, help us to process those people. And uh, the big public one that we're doing is gonna be at the Silver Room on 53rd Street, um, the big store, everybody on the South Side knows the Silver Room. Um, and that uh, is on the 22nd from two to, two to eight p.m. And we are gonna have tables outside. It looks like it's gonna be beautiful weather. Uh, so we're gonna have tables outside. Eric's been great. Um, he's been pushing it out in his social media for us. Um, and those volunteer slots are full. Everybody wants to do that. That's going to be fun. Um, but we do need volunteers to come and sit at our registration tables. And we're going to have PPE, I hope. Um, the alderman, I think, is donating that for us. Um, we haven't gotten a confirmation. And then additionally, um, beyond September 22nd, we uh, have been doing what we call sidewalk brigades. And this is where two, three, four of us uh, hit the sidewalk with clipboards and, you know, with our forms in hand, you know. Um, and we have t-shirts that say, ask me how to register to vote. And we just walk up to people and say, are you registered to vote? And do you need a mail-in ballot? And do you know that there's a drop box you can put your ballot in? Um, and people overall are extraordinarily receptive. And we've gotten permission from um, the Kimbark Plaza at 53rd and Kimbark to actually, well, that's private property, so we had to get permission. But he said, yeah, you guys, this is important. Come and be in our parking lot as much as you want. So Fridays, uh, because a lot of folks are going to Kimbark Beverage on a Friday afternoon and evening, <laughs> uh, we're in that parking lot on Fridays. And then we do uh, the sidewalk outside of, on 53rd and Lake Park, outside of, um, Starbucks Chipotle roti uh, on Sunday evenings from like four. We've been doing five to 6.30, but it's moving up earlier because the days are getting shorter. Um, so we're out there as well and definitely need volunteers. And then the third place is we do the 61st Street Farmer's Market every Saturday morning from nine to two. And same thing, um, we do not have permission. We don't have a table there. We can't be in the farmer's market. So we stand you know, 20 feet outside and speak to folks as they're coming into the market. And are you registered to vote? Do you need a mail-in ballot? Do you have any questions? All those things. And we, would, and we, are, we started out with just four of us. We found each other on the Nextdoor app. And we now have, I think there's 31 people getting my emails now. And we're just steadily growing and we're looking for more people. Um, anybody that wants to help can email me at nwvotechicago at gmail.com. That's for neighbors who vote Chicago at, so it's nwvote at sh nwvote chicago at gmail.com. And we also are looking for somebody who likes to do Twitter and Facebook, because we have Twitter and Facebook accounts that need to be activated. So if anybody um, wants to be disseminating, and, uh, and then I suppose I'll put in a final uh, plug for our Twitter storms, then this, this is not my initiative. We do this with Indivisible and we're in alliance with most of you on this call. Um, we do our Twitter storms on Wednesdays under the hashtag virus free voting Illinois. And this past Wednesday, we got 2 million impressions for our tweets. So oh. sending out information about safe voting by mail um, in Illinois. And uh, we're always looking for people for that too, but that's not my thing. That's off topic, technically, sorry. Had to uh, get, get on a promotional roll, couldn't help myself. Thank you for giving me a moment to let everybody know what's going on. I, I look forward to having people join us. Thank you, thank you. And Julia, if you wouldn't mind, um, uh, put, if you can put some of that in the chat right now, um, that would be really good. Yeah, so, especially okay. the email. You could put yes, that, that would be great. Right. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me, appreciate it. Our pleasure. Um, okay, folks, it's um, it's seven thirty, and so um, we we've gone through most of our questions that have been submitted in advance, um, and so um, and I want to make sure that we got to everyone's questions. So if you have um, a question or if your question hasn't been answered, 
um, feel free to either put it in the chat or, um, or raise your hand now, um, uh, because uh, if, we, if, if not, then we are going to wrap up soon. So last call for questions, um, either through the chat or through raising your hand. All right, so um, at this, that wraps up. Uh, let's see, do we have anything else? Yes, okay, good. So that will wrap up our um, questions for the night. Um, I wanna personally thank all of our participants and all of our speakers. Um, it's been my pleasure to be one of your MCs tonight. Um, I would like to hand it off to um, HPKCC President Philin Crawford, um, who will close us out for the evening. Phylon, just give her a minute to jump on here. Thank you, Ali. On behalf of the High Park Campbell Community Conference, I would like to thank you for joining us for tonight's community dialogue on voting rights. I also want to thank Alex Boutros, Chicago Votes. Ami Gandhi, Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Catherine Mardikes, League of Women Voters Chicago. And thank you to the League of Women Voters Chicago for collaborating with HPKCC on this event. Mahima Parani, Ballot Ready, thank you. Barbara Moreno Paschal, HPKCC board member and organizer. Mila Jameson, HPKCC board member and organizer. The conversation does not end today. And HPKCC would like your voices to continue to be heard. If you'd like more information about HPKCC and to get involved, please visit our website at hydepark.org. You can become a member of our organization, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. HPKCC is holding a follow-up community dialogue on the criminal legal system, which we held, <clears throat> excuse me, which will be held in October. Please visit our website at www.hypark.org to learn more about our next event. You can also join HPKCC at our annual meeting, which will be held on Sunday, September 27th at 3 p.m. on Zoom. Thank you, stay safe, and good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ali. You're great. Thank you, Catherine.